that's the thing. No. No, I've got a metal arm and the cold thrust. I know when it's coming, too. I'm like, but bless her heart. Bless his heart. Test two.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. Also with you. Well, I'll, I, I got you. Okay. Appreciate you. As we gather in worship, we light these candles to remind ourselves and one another that Christ is indeed in our midst. Yours being proactive, Randy. Yes, sir. Sisters and brothers, it is Advent. We come into a season of expectation of looking forward, a season of hopefulness, a season in which we await the coming of Christ as a child, but also the second coming of Christ, the thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And for all of the other ways that Christ meets us in our midst and in our daily lives. So as we enter into this, our first worship service of Advent, let us go to God in prayer. O oh God, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer, all that we have and all that we are are yours. Or we gather in this sacred space, in this sacred season, looking forward to the birth of our Messiah, but also thankful for the ways in which he is already here, for the ways in which he meets us where we are, even in the midst of our week, in the midst of our world, in the midst of the mess of life. But God, as we gather here in this space this morning, we ask that we would encounter him with open eyes and an open heart, that you would equip us for his service, that your spirit would move among us and through us, and that our, worthy, that our worship would be worthy for you, O oh God, are worthy of worship. Now all that we say and do bring you glory and honor in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Advent is a time to hear again of God's redeeming work. Advent is a time to hear again of God's reconciling love. Advent is a time to hear again of God's unmerited grace. Advent is a time to hear again of our ultimate hope. Give us ears, O oh Lord, and help us to hear. Today we light the first candle. The first candle reminds us that as we wait upon the Lord, we do so with a sense of heightened awareness. In a world where our attention is easily diverted in many directions, Advent is a time to quiet ourselves and listen for God's word with expectant ears. This Advent, may we hear and receive the message of the one who continues to speak.
Thank you for the ways you continue to speak to a world in need. Through both prophets and angels, you declared the message of hope, the way of healing, and the coming of a Savior. As you spoke in the days of old, so we know you continue to speak to us today. As we begin our Advent journey, grant us ears that truly hear and hearts to openly receive. We pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Will you please stand and join us in song? Verse 1, and then we ask you join us again on verse 1.
seated. Our scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 5 through 22. And since Mason did such a great job lighting her Advent candle, I didn't want his sister Layla to feel left out, so she is giving me a hand at scripture. Mason, it was good of you to share the limelight with your sister. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Once, when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and, you're, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be a great sight of the Lord. He, he is never to take wine or any fermented, fermented drink, and he, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will, be, he will bring back many of the people of Israel to the, to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in spirit and power of Elijah to turn their hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom and the righteousness to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I have been sent to speak to you and tell, this, tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until this day happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will the children come forward? to see you guys again. Long time, huh? Yeah. Well, today we're going to kind of go along with what we talked about in Sunday school this morning, all right? I'm going to read you part of a story. It's a story that I thought was really, really cool. It's called Horton Hatches the Egg. Who's seen you've, you've seen Horton Hears a Who? Yeah. So who do you think Horton is? He's the, He's the elephant. What's he doing? He's bending the branch. Why do you think he's bending the branch? Yeah, he's an elephant. It um, was hard for him to get up there and do that? Yes. Yeah, probably so. Well, we're going to see why he's doing this. And again, I'm not going to read the whole story because it's kind of long. I'm just going to read parts of it. Okay, and then we're going we're gonna to talk about why this is important and how it relates to what we're talking about today. So this is a story by Dr. Seuss. And it's a wonderful story about an elephant named Horton. Well, the story begins with this lazy bird named Maisie. And she's sitting on her egg in her nest in the tree. But sitting on that egg was tiresome and boring. And Maisie hated it. 
So she said, you know, I'd like to take a vacation. I'd like to fly off for a rest. If only I could find someone to sit on my nest. Well, that's when Horton walked by. And Maisie asked Horton if, she, if he would sit on her egg while she just took a little rest. Well, Horton objected at first because, you know, he's big and the nest is in a tree and he's afraid he's going to squish it. But Maisie promised that she was only going to be gone for just a little while. So Horton finally agreed. And in the story, it talks about what he did to get ready for that. And soon he was sitting on the nest while Maisie flew off to Florida for vacation. Florida, Florida yeah. Well, while she was in Florida, she had so much fun that she decided she was never going to return to that nest. Days turned into weeks and weeks turned into months. But Horton kept sitting there day after day. Winter came and icicles hung from Horton's trunk and his feet. But still, he remained faithful to his promise to Maisie. I'll stay on this egg and I won't let it freeze, he said with a sneeze. I meant what I said and I said what I meant. An elephant is faithful 100%. Now, I don't know if elephants are really faithful 100%, but I do know someone who is. Who is faithful 100% of the time? God is always faithful no, no matter what. The Bible is full of promises that God has made to us. Has he ever broken a promise? No. So if we asked him to sit on that egg, he would have sat there, right? Just like Horton did, yeah. Well, you know, we, you just read the scripture about the man named Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth. And they were faithful to God. They were faithful 100% to God. And did God reward them? What did he do? How did he reward them? Yeah, he gave them a child that they had been so desperately wanting. And why was it such a surprise? Why was it such a, a miracle? Right. And so when the angel Gabriel said, you're going to have a child, they're like, what? But did they remain faithful? Yes. Yeah, they remained faithful that whole time. You know, sometimes we make promises to God. Do we always keep our promises? Do we always? Mm, yeah, I think if we're honest, we could say we probably don't always keep our, our promises to God. You know, we're, we're ending this year and we're going to start a new year. And in the new year... We like to make promises. They're called New Year's resolutions. Well, sometimes we don't keep them very long. I know that. But, you know, God is always faithful to keeping his promises to us. And so we need to try really hard to be faithful to keep our promises to God. And we need to be like Horton when he said, I meant what I said and I said what I meant. And we need to be faithful 100%. Dear Father, as you are faithful in keeping your promises to us, may we be faithful in keeping our promises to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How do you come to worship today? Do you come excited? Do you come overjoyed? Do you come weighed down, struggling, concerned, or nervous? Well, however we gather here, or if it's a little of all of the above, Christ meets us here. Christ cares for us here. And what a privilege that we can come together taking the things of our life, the stuff, and lay it at the throne of mercy. So together, church, let's go to God in prayer. We will pray silently, and then I will pray for us as a whole. Let's pray.
Oh God, we come before you now just as we are. We gather in this place called your beloved children, called to be part of your family. Thankful, Lord, for that being made possible by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the one for whom we wait in Advent. O Lord, this Sunday we are reminded of the hope that is ours through our Lord Jesus Christ, of the hope eternal and the hope in this life too. But God, we confess to you that as we look at the world around us, so often things seem well, less than hopeful. So Lord, we turn those hopeless seeming situations over to you. For the hopelessness we see on a grand scale of a world wrecked by violence and war and dissension. By a world that is so unlike your kingdom above. God, we turn it over to you, asking for you to intercede and hear your very creation groaning for its creator. And God, in response to the brokenness of this world, we ask that your church here and universal that has experienced hope in Jesus Christ might be a beacon for hope. That we might be the ones in all places and all situations to point to a way that things can be differently. To a way in which things can be changed in Jesus Christ. O oh Lord, for the ways in which hopelessness abounds in those places closer to home. Those people that we know who are hopeless in dealing with a diagnosis whose hope is crushed by the loss of a loved one or the empty table or the empty seat at the table in these holiday seasons. God, all of us know those struggling. So Lord, we ask that you would be their hope and help us to wrap our arms around them. But more than that, to be the arms of Jesus Christ to them. Oh God, we know those in need of healing of body, and God, we ask for it. We know those in need of healing of relationships, of healing of situations. Lord, we know those whose eyes need to be opened to the light of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we bring you all of that and more. Oh Lord, your scripture this morning shows us an example of news that was too good to be believed. And God, we confess that we too gather here having received the good news of the gospel that we do not deserve. And God, for the ways in which we have not responded in faith to that message, for the ways in which we have not stepped out where you lead us, for the ways in which we get between you and us, and each other. God, forgive us, restore us, and make us new. Oh God, we ask that we would go forth from this place boldly proclaiming what you have done for us. Boldly living into the reconciliation and grace and unity and family that is ours through our Lord God in flesh, Emmanuel, in whose name we pray. Amen.
What is finally Advent, it is finally the appropriate time for Christmas music everywhere. Because it is Christmas in the church calendar, by golly. The Christmas season, where we look forward anxiously awaiting the birth of Christ. Though in the world, the celebration of Christmas, or the lead-up to Christmas, seems to begin earlier and earlier each year. It seems like by the middle of October, one of our local stations was already playing Christmas music, and Mariah Carey had long since come out of hibernation to once again torment us with All I Want for Christmas is You. There were already Christmas decorations on the shelves everywhere, it's seemingly at the end of summer. And I complain about that sort of thing, partly because I'm a little bit of an Advent purist, right? When it's not Advent, it's not Christmas season yet. But also, partly, because if I'm being honest, I'm kind of a Grinch. I'm a little bit of a Scrooge. You know, some people who just love Christmas shopping, Christmas cookies, Christmas music, Christmas parties, Christmas this, Christmas that, Christmas lights, well, that's not me. Now granted, I have learned to make certain concessions to live in family and live in community. You know, we lit our Christmas candles in the house just yesterday. One cinnamon, one spruce. To make sure, as my wife put it, we got that Christmas bouquet. To me, it means the living room smells like Hobby Lobby from here on out. And of course, between here and the 24th of December, at some point we will have to watch White Christmas. Probably it's a wonderful life, but I will slip in my Christmas movie, the original Die Hard. It, the Messiah's not born until Hans Gruber is thrown out of Nakatomi Plaza. It's, sorry. No, I'm not much of a commercial or Christmas in the cultural sense guy. Now, don't get me wrong. I love Advent. I love Advent worship series. I love our Christmas Eve service. I love spending time with family. And sure, I love giving gifts to my son, Asher, to watch him be thrilled with them for five minutes and then forget all about them. I love Christmas Day. I love the sacred family time. And of course, I love the idea of hope and peace and joy and love and making our hearts ready for the Lord. But the magic of the Christmas season just always strikes me as a little bit hollow, right? Because in a time of year where we should be talking about the one who brings peace, does it ever seem like it's the most hectic and busy and stressful time of year instead? For a time when we're proclaiming the one who brought good news to the poor, so often we just find more things out there to separate us from our hard-earned dollars. And in the same way, in a time of year where so many people act more kind, more charitable, more generous than usual, we kind of are reminded that, you know, these needs of our neighbor exist the whole rest of the year, too. Yeah, some of the magic of Christmas in our society is kind of lost on me. But there's one thing our world gets right. Even as we creep towards celebrating Christmas before 4th of July, as some stores seem to do, there's one thing they get right, and that is a long lead-up looking forward. A long intro, a long escalating build-up looking forward to Christmas. We get that right because we should, as Christians, be looking forward, preparing, thinking about, decorating, and moving things around in our heart for an encounter with Jesus long before he gets here. Advent is a season of waiting, of expectation, of looking forward to something so, so good. And in that way, all of our society's Christmas prep seems a little more appropriate. And this idea of waiting, of looking forward to something good, and then what are you going to do about it when it actually gets there? Well, that's where our scripture hits us this morning. Because you see, Zechariah the priest, who is now told he is going to be the father of John the Baptist, the one who prepares the way for the Lord and will eventually baptize him, this guy is the epitome of someone who has been waiting for a good thing. He has been waiting for a good thing on behalf of the Hebrew people. 
Because he is a priest, it is his job to remind them of God's promises, keep them faithful to God's law, and keep them constantly looking forward to the Messiah, to God at work in their community, and how God is calling them to live. He is a guy who lives in that looking forward space. We hear that he is part of a couple who has been looking forward to something for a long time. They had prayed and prayed and hoped and hoped and prayed some more for a child that never came. And in those days, that child was not just a bundle of joy. That child was your economic safety net for when you were old. That child was who carried on the name, who got all of the inheritance. That child was also their responsibility as Levites, as part of the priestly line, because they have to make and raise up the next class of priests. So they have been waiting, praying, hoping. They're waiting as a people and they're waiting as a couple. And also, Zechariah would have been waiting for this specific day for a very long time. When we first read over this, it's easy to think this is business as usual for Zechariah. And in one way it was. He's a priest and he's on duty. But he is the one burning incense in the most holy of places. And that was a a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. It said there, according to the cut, division was on duty. There were 24 divisions of priests. Therefore, each one working out to a duty station of about two weeks per year at the temple. Within that two-week span, for each worship, they would cast lots for who would be the one serving within the holiest of positions, offering the incense. But among those who put in for that cast, first, everyone who had never done it had to cast their lot. And they said it average per capita a once-in-a-lifetime event. So this is his day. Zechariah's up at bat. You know, if there was ever going to be a day where you might expect that something big, something miraculous was going to happen to this old boy, this might be the day. But strangely, he's not expecting it. Strangely, he's going about this sacred duty, leaning into his sacred calling as though it's business as usual. But then we get the rest of the story. The angel shows up and says, Zechariah, he's terrified, which most of the time is the response when you see an angel. An angel's first words in the Bible are most always, do not be afraid, because apparently they're a little intimidating. And the angel tells him, Zechariah, this baby that y'all have been asking for, praying for, that you and your wife think you can't have, you're going to get it. And not only that, but he is going to be one who turns the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the laws of God, he promises that this child will reconcile the nation not just spiritually but also socially, right? Familially. That's an easy word to say. Familially. And it lays out this future for John the Baptist that is going to be so great. And Zechariah says, how do I know this will come to be? How can it be so, as I am old, but he's a little more tactful, and my wife is well along in years, spoken like a husband. And the angel's response to his phrase, I am old, is, yeah, well, you're old, but I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God Most High, and I have been sent to give you this message. But because you don't get it, you're going to be unable to speak until the child is born. So then he walks out and it says the people have been waiting for so long because this is other big part of this day. As he offers the incense, then this is his one time. He goes out and he proclaims a blessing to all of the people. He gives a benediction on God's behalf to the people of Israel. His one chance. And when he opens his mouth, he can't speak. And apparently through pointy, grunting, whatever he is able to do, he is able to convey to the people, I saw something in there that was unlike anything else. 
And then he goes home and they conceive and have a child. And all through the pregnancy, he is mute. Until it comes time to give birth. Elizabeth is a lot smarter. She immediately figures this is a miracle of God and praises God. You know, the women tend to be the first one to get the program. And then... Zechariah, when the baby is born and it comes time for him to be named, Elizabeth has said, we want to name him John, but the whole family knows better. You don't have a relative named John? That's not a very good name. Why don't you name him Zechariah Jr. after his daddy and he'll be a priest just like him? And Zechariah gets the tablet that he's writing on and writes, his name is John. And his mouth is opened, his tongue is loosened, And he begins to praise God spontaneously, proclaiming how God has kept God's promises. It's a fantastic story of worship and of wonder and of God meeting a very experienced believer where he was. Someone who had been asking and praying and hoping for a divine touch, for something to happen in his life for a long time. But when it happens, when it shows up, He misses the forest for the trees. He doesn't get on board. And he misses out on proclaiming God's goodness for ten months because of it. I do have to say, as an aside, it's funny the different things that stick out to you when you read Scripture for the tenth and twentieth and thirtieth time. And this time something stuck out to my immature sense of humor. When I read it this time, I looked and went, wait a second, she was not pregnant when he went back home. And the dude's mute. He goes home, and they have a baby after he can't talk. I think that might be the gospel saying, Husbands, if you just shut up, life goes a little better. (laughs) Could be a... Sorry, I have an immature sense of humor. I just read that, and I'm going, That guy's come hither look must be on point. And that's where we are here. And we know that the baby who is born is Jesus' cousin. He is the camel-skin-wearing, honey-eating holy man who dunks disciples in the Jordan, who baptizes Jesus, who challenges the Pharisees and calls many to repentance. He prepares the way of the Lord. So what is in this story for us? And you see, during this Advent sermon series, we're going to look at a lot of these announcements. We're going to look at the angel's visit to Mary and to Joseph. We're going to see Herod's response to the news of a new king in town and the wise men as well. But first we have Zechariah and the forerunner. And he responds with hesitation. With here is the thing I have asked for, looked for, hoped for, expected so long, but now that it's here in front of me I hesitate. So where does this hit us? We're going to have so many hopeful words, so many encouraging words from Mary proclaiming the gospel, from the wise men getting on board and outboxing an evil king. But this one, church, I feel has a couple warnings for us. This is not the uplifting Advent sermon. Because you see, when I look at this, I see the story of Zechariah shows us some things because, well, we're a lot like Zechariah. Zechariah had a lifetime of service in the church. He had a lifetime of education, a lifetime relationship to God and God's people. Yet when God acted in his midst, he didn't recognize it and didn't believe it. It teaches us that we as a people of faith, both individually and also corporately as the church, cannot rest on our laurels. It said here that He and his wife were blameless and righteous in every way, and still he messed up and is struck mute. I don't know about you, but in all the ways you could describe Josh, blameless wouldn't be one of them. So I think that tells us it doesn't matter what your past history is. It doesn't matter if you've been an elder, a deacon, a treasurer, or a reverend, or whatever. Have 40, 50, 60 plus years of church attendance and service. Never rest on your laurels. Always be expecting God is going to show up somehow in a new way and I just might miss it and be terrified to do so. It's a stark reminder that for those of us living in the faith, complacency kills. Because He does the thing He's been trained to do 
And when he is told that the prayer you have prayed a million times will be answered, yeah, sure, whatever, it doesn't make sense to me now. Do we ever see that same thing? Do we ever get complacent? I've asked for this, I've asked for this, I've prayed for a change, I've prayed for God to open these eyes. I think it's a warning to not grow complacent because sometimes God has a timing and a plan that is greater than we can see. Because if they had had John the Baptist as a timely, normal baby, where's the miracle in that? Also, he would have been far too old to be Jesus' cousin, to grow up with him, to have the wonderful story of a John the Baptist in the womb leaping when pregnant Mary approaches his mother. Sometimes hope deferred is part of God's greater glory. And we can never get complacent in asking, in waiting, and expecting. And finally, I think the warning in this is that proximity should bring with it more responsibility because he is closer to God than Mary when she gets the news. Right? Zechariah has been in service for years and years and years. Here he is in the Holy of Holies. And when he gets told this is what's going to happen, he doesn't believe it and it goes, you're going to be mute. That seems a little harsh when you consider that Mary's exact response is almost the same. When Gabriel comes to her and says, you're going to have this child, she goes, how can it be I'm not married? He says, how can it be I'm old? She says, how can it be I'm young? But to Mary, she gets an explanation whereas Zechariah gets held accountable. And I think it's because that went longer. He had more education, more experience. He was held to a standard because of his proximity. So we as the church need to let that sink in because as I look around out here, I might see a few more Zechariahs than I see Marys, judging by hair color, okay? We have experience. We have some knowledge. And because of that, we have some responsibility. And that responsibility, I think, talks to us at Advent and every other day to have eyes open where Zechariah's were closed. To have open eyes that when you come to this table during Advent, as you have a million times before, you actually expect an encounter with Jesus Christ in a deeper, more meaningful way than you've encountered Him before. In this season of Advent, as you go to your knees in prayer, as you open your Scriptures... We have to expect God to direct us, guide us, speak to us in a deeper, more tangible way than Because it was all just a drill for Zechariah until it wasn't. And sometimes it's a drill for us too until it's not. The other thing it proves to us is God's sovereignty because Zechariah did not cause God to not do what God was going to do. God still made John the Baptist happen. Zechariah played his role, but all his stubbornness and failing to see God at work and follow where he's going, all it did was cost him ten months of praising the Lord's name. All it did was cost him the enjoyment of taking part in it. God got it done anyways. So finally, that's a lesson to us, church. God is going to do what God's going to do in the world, in your life, in my life, and in our life. And my prayer is that we have open eyes, that we have expectation of His presence, expect Him to lead us, guide us, direct us, and call us into things too good to be true. Because God's going to do it anyways. But I hope instead of being mute about it, we're the ones proclaiming His goodness, proclaiming what He has done, and proclaiming how He has kept every promise He ever made. Gather here in Jesus' name is love.
Here we gather at our Lord's table where we encounter Him in a way that is sacred but also familiar. But as we gather at this table, may we do so with eyes open anew, with hearts that are sensitive to His presence, to be changed by Him in any way He wants us to be. It is that Lord who changes us, who meets us here, whom we remember As we remember how on the night when he was to be betrayed, he took bread and broke it and said, This is my body, broken for you. Take and eat of it in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper. And he blessed it and said, This cup is a new covenant in my blood for you, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink of this in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim our Lord's life and death and resurrection until He comes again. As we come to this table today, you know, the Lord has made things easy for us, it sounds, doesn't it? He's made it so easy. All we have to do is believe. Take the cup. Remember the crucifixion. Remember the blood that was drawn. And then just tell him. Easy. Yeah. It's easy. But sometimes it's not easy, is it? Let's pray, please. As we come to this table... Help us remember God's love, his promise of eternal life. As we take the bread and drink this cup, help us remember the sacrifice of his son and the joy of his resurrection. God has given us the way and his prayer to lead us. Please repeat with me the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
now time to, for us to give. A few years back, one of our elders said something that I've remembered time and time again. He says, you know, it's hard to know exactly how much to give, when to give, depending on your situation. He said, when you go out to get a hamburger, the next time, why don't you put the cost of that hamburger in the plate extra for something? Those of you that had our meeting last week, we talked about the budget. We talked about it's going to be a challenge to get there. Well, maybe a little bit of hamburger money would help a little bit as we take our morning off. I'm saying I don't think I should forget the Lord's Prayer, should I? Please pray with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom power and the glory forever. I'd also like to pray a little bit about the givers. Father, we're thankful for this offering. Please bless the gift and people who has given. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, we come to this table invited by our Lord. As such, we extend an invitation. Every time before we leave, we ask if there's anyone here who's been moved to make a confession of faith or who would like to join with us in what we're doing here at FCC Kerrville as we live into God's calling. You're invited to come forward during our hymn of invitation.
Now receive this benediction. As you go forth, may God bless you richly, and may God's Spirit guide and direct you. In all things, may you expect to encounter the Lord at work. And may you be on His mission when you do. Go in peace, church. Amen.